Hey guys, this is Ms. Benson. Today we're going to talk about our last market structure in microeconomics, and that's going to be oligopolies. Now in oligopolies, the prefix olig means just a few. So in an oligopoly, basically you don't have many firms that dominate, you don't have one firm that dominates, you have just a few handful of firms that dominate the majority of the industry. Well the actions of one firm has a huge impact on the profits and the outcomes of all of the other remaining firms. You think about it, if there's only five firms that are dominating an industry, then each one of those five firms is 20% of the market. If they have a great advertising campaign or if they lower their price, that's taking a lot of customers away from the other four sellers. So guys, really important, I want you to know that these firms are considered interdependent. They're not independent. Independent means that you're handling your own business and the only person that you're going to affect is yourself. Well, that's true for monopolies because there's only one person in the market. And that's pretty much true for competition because if you're one out of thousands, you really can't have much of an impact on the market anyway. You're so small compared to the entire market. But in oligopolies, you're a big chunk of the market. So your actions don't just affect you. Your actions affect others and their actions affect your outcomes and your profits. So oligopolistic firms are interdependent. If you think Think about the cell phone service industry in the United States, there's only about a handful of major cell phone service providers that are competing in the United States. That's a good example of an oligopoly. Now these firms normally are competing against each other, but what if one day they all got together and had lunch? Say they all went out to lunch one day and you know they got to talking and they were saying, you know what guys, instead of competing with each other, why don't we all get together and charge the same high price? and we'll all offer the exact same plan. If these oligopolists get together and they make this agreement and they act in unison, then what they are doing is colluding. This is known as collusion. When these firms collude, they are officially known as a cartel. And you may have heard of cartels in the world. Now, of course, you may have heard of OPEC. That's going to be the oil producing countries. So the organization of petroleum exporting countries. We know that they definitely are profitable by doing this because all of these people that are in charge of the oil production in these countries, they definitely aren't poor. They're restricting the oil output and that makes the price for this oil go up. And the rest of the world either pays that high price or they have to find a different way to get oil, which sometimes is not easy to do. Now, this is really profitable for the businesses involved. As long as they keep that agreement, they're all going to collectively do pretty well and make tons of profits. But the customer inside of you should be cringing right now. Think about if all the cell phone service industries got together and charged the same high price of $400 a month. Y'all, some of us can't live without our cell phone service, right? I mean, our demand for that is like seriously inelastic. Some of us are so hooked on our phones, it's such a necessity for us. And so if there's no other place to get your cell phone service, then basically there's an ultimatum for customers. These businesses have said, you either pay this price or you just do without cell phone service because there's no other cell phone provider that is offering a lower price. We're all charging the same high price. So it's really bad for customers. Generally, it's bad for society because it reduces competition and we know how competition is better for society but because it leads to better allocative efficiency. Now it's illegal for firms to do this in the United States. Within the boundaries of the United States we have laws called antitrust laws that were established in the late 1800s right around the time of industrialization that tried to keep markets more competitive and that tried to make it where a few firms didn't dominate an industry. This started off with the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. But collusion is not illegal in other parts of the world, which is why OPEC, I mean, they're definitely allowed to collude. They're in other parts of the world. They don't have our US antitrust laws that are binding them. So oligopolies sound like, hey, I mean, if we all get together and we all work together and collude and make a cartel, we're gonna be rich and it's gonna be great, but not so easy. Even though acting together in unison will be profitable for all of the businesses involved, there's always that temptation for these firms to cheat on their agreement. If I break my agreement and lower my price, all of the customers are gonna come to me and none of the customers are gonna be with my competitors and pay 400 bucks a month. 
cartels are very unstable because they only really last as long as the firms can trust each other to stick with their agreement. But there's such a big temptation to break the agreement and cheat because if you lower your price beneath all your other competitors, you're gonna steal all those customers right out from under them and you're gonna be maximizing your individual profits. Now, one tool that helps us study oligopolies is something called game theory. Game theory is the study of how people behave in strategic situations. And that definitely is the case in oligopolies. Only in oligopolies can the actions of one seller have big impacts on the other sellers in the market. Now, let me introduce game theory to you with a little story called The Prisoner's Dilemma. Suppose we have two prisoners, we'll call them Bonnie and Clyde, and the police have been after Bonnie and Clyde for a long time because they know that they have been responsible for all kinds of crimes, even some serious crimes, but yet the police have not been able to get any solid evidence to convict Bonnie and Clyde. Well, one day, the police get lucky. They do arrest Bonnie and Clyde on a minor charge, maybe possession or something like that. So they have them in custody, they have them at the police station, and what they really wanna do more than anything else is try to get a confession so that they can charge them for these more serious crimes that they know that Bonnie and Clyde are responsible for. Now, are they gonna have Bonnie and Clyde in the same room whenever they interrogate them and try to get a confession? Absolutely not. The two prisoners, they probably made this agreement not to talk to the police, not to give them any more information than is necessary. When the police take these two prisoners and try to interrogate them and get a confession out of them, they're separated into different rooms. And the point of this is they're going to try to make each one of these criminals doubt whether or not they can trust the other person to stick with their agreement to stay quiet. So here's what they do. First off, they're going over to Klein. And they say, Clyde, okay, listen, we know you probably already agree that you're not gonna talk, but let me just tell you this. Bonnie over there in the other room, she is like confessing everything. And she is saying that all of these serious crimes, they were all your idea. She's gonna pin all these serious crimes on you. She's gonna let you take the entire fall for these crimes. Now, like we said, it's up to you if you don't wanna cooperate, but if you tell us your side of the story, we may be able to go a little bit easier on you. So Clyde gets to thinking, is Bonnie really saying that? She wouldn't do that, would she? He's really racking his brain wondering if he can trust Bonnie to stay quiet like she said she was gonna do when they first arrived at the police station. Now, is Bonnie really saying that stuff? Probably not. I mean, the police are probably just making it up and they're telling Bonnie the same thing. And so that gets Bonnie thinking, can I really trust Clyde? Well, we have a diagram, guys, that can help us to understand these strategies, these choices, and the different outcomes from them. It's called a payoff matrix. We have Bonnie on one side, on the top, and we have Clyde on the side. And notice that we have two choices for Bonnie. She can either talk or she can not confess. Same thing for Clyde. Now, of course, if they both stay quiet like they originally planned to do, then the police have no confession for these serious crimes. So the most they can put Bonnie and Clyde away for is like one year on that minor charge. If Bonnie confesses and Clyde stays quiet, she gets off scot-free and Clyde takes the entire fall for the crime so he goes away for 20 years. On the flip side, if Bonnie stays quiet but Clyde talks, so she goes away for 20 years and he gets off scot-free. Now if they both end up confessing, they're both going to be going to jail for 10 years. What should they do? They would both be better off collectively if they stayed quiet. But can you trust the person in the other room? If you do not know what the other person is going to do, then what you might want to look at is pursuing your dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is the one that leads to more favorable outcomes for you, regardless of what the other person does. Let's go back to the payoff matrix and take a look at Bonnie. Now, Bonnie definitely has a dominant strategy in this situation. Let's look at her outcomes from confessing and not confessing. If she stays quiet and does not confess, then she is definitely going to jail. The only question is, is it one year or 20 years? If she confesses, then she could get off scot-free or she could only go to jail for 10 years. So take a look at our outcomes, guys. 10 years in jail is definitely better than 20 years in jail. 
and no gel is definitely better than one year. So Bonnie definitely has a dominant strategy. Her outcomes look definitely more favorable if she confesses versus staying quiet. Sometimes when you work these problems, people will have dominant strategies. Sometimes when you work these problems, the people may not have a clear dominant strategy and that's okay. Now there's also one last thing with oligopolies we gotta talk about in game theory called the Nash Equilibrium. The Nash Equilibrium is basically a situation where people are in the best situation that they can be and changing their strategy will not benefit them. Changing to the next strategy will not help them out in any way. So they're already in the best strategy that they can be in. Suppose we have two guys that own stores on the same street. We have Benny and Usnavi, all right? And so Benny can decide to either charge high prices or low prices for the stuff in his store. And Usnavi can either choose a high price level or a low price level for the stuff in his store. If you look in this payoff matrix, Usnavi's daily profits are gonna be the first ones that are listed. So if you want to, you can go through and put a U on top of all of the first entries in these squares just to help you keep track of it. And then Benny's daily profits are gonna be the second entries in these squares. So I like to go through and put a B on top of all of the second numbers in these squares just so I can keep track of who's making what. Let's try to see if Benny has a dominant strategy. If Benny price is high and Usnavi price is high, then Benny is gonna earn $400. If Benny price is high and Usnavi price is low, then Benny is gonna earn $1,000. If Benny charges a low price level and Usnavi charges a high price level, then Benny's daily profits are gonna be $600. If Benny charges a low price level and Usnavi charges a low price level, then Benny's daily profits are gonna be $800. So if Benny pursues a low price strategy, then he's either going to get $600 or $800. Well, $600 is better than $400, but $800 is not better than $1,000. So in this case, guys, Benny does not have a clear dominant strategy. But what about Usnavi? Maybe he has a dominant strategy. Now, if Usnavi charges a high price and Benny charges a high price, then Usnavi makes $500. If Usnavi charges a high price and Benny charges a low price, then Usnavi makes $900. If Usnavi charges a low price and Benny charges a high price, then Usnavi is going to get $360 in daily profit. And if Usnavi charges a low price and Benny also charges a low price, then Usnavi is gonna get $780 in daily profit. If Usnavi charges a high price, he's either gonna get $500 or $900. But if he charges a low price, he's either gonna get $360 or $780. Well y'all, 360 is less than 500, and 780 is less than 900. So Usnavi definitely has a clear dominant strategy. Usnavi definitely will earn more money if he charges a high price than if he charges a low price. Now let's find the Nash Equilibrium. Remember the Nash Equilibrium basically is a situation where people are doing the best that they can and they really don't have any motivation to change their strategy. Now we know that Usnavi is going to be charging a high price because that's his dominant strategy. So it would be the best for Benny if he were to charge a low price. He would rather make $600 than $400. So our Nash equilibrium in this example, where each person is the best they can and they have no motivation to change their strategy, is really gonna be in the top right corner with Benny charging a low price and Usnavi charging a high price, which is his dominant strategy. The key to them really is, guys, labeling the things in the payoff matrix and making sure that you are understanding the numbers that you're looking at and just not getting them sort of crossed. If you can keep everything organized and understand what you're looking at and which square means which, then you'll be fine. We'll do plenty of practice with these. You'll work with them a lot and then you'll be seeing payoff matrices and you'll understand exactly what they mean and be able to interpret them with no problem at all. So until then guys, I'll see you later.